Welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to talk about some exciting new developments in nanotechnology. I have two guests. On my far right is ZX Shen, the Paul Pigo Professor of Physical Sciences at Stanford University. He's also a former chief scientist at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and winner of numerous awards including the E.O. Lawrence Award from the U.S. Department of Energy, the Oliver Buckley Prize from the American Physical Society, and the Einstein Professorship from the Chinese Academy of Sciences. On my near right is Nicholas Malosh, Associate Professor of Material Science and Engineering at Stanford University, faculty member at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, and winner of the National Science Foundation Early Career Award. Both men have their own laboratories at Stanford, where they train and mentor graduate students and postdoctoral students to be the next generation of scientists. And I'd like to welcome both of you to the program today. Thanks, Marty. Nick, Thank let me start with us. you. I understand that you're doing a lot of work with diamondoids. What exactly is a diamondoid? So a diamondoid is actually a small fragment of a whole larger piece of diamond. So if you took a large diamond, let's say one carat of diamond, and I cut it into smaller and smaller pieces, at the end you'd be left with a small molecule of just a few cages of diamond. And that's what we call a diamondoid. So this is the smallest theoretical possible actual diamond? That's right. It's the smallest piece of diamond that you could get. If you break it any smaller, it's no longer diamond. Uh, and interestingly, this actually is derived from oil wells. So you can actually find diamondoids in oil wells off the coast of Alabama, let's say, or Gulf of Mexico. And so actually, if you're driving your car, you're probably burning little bits of diamond uh, during that process. Now, do they occur just in nature, or do you have to actually manufacture your own? Do you do you take a real diamond and slice it very thin until you have diamondoids? Yeah, unfortunately, you can't take a big diamond and cut it that small. Um, people have been able to make very, very small ones synthetically using organic chemistry, where you can uh, basically join carbon molecules together to make one small cage. But it's really small. And so it turns out the ones that you find in nature can also be smaller size, but you can get bigger, two diamond cages together, and three, and four, and five. And so you get this nice systematic series of different sizes of diamondoid, and they have different properties. And what do you do with them once you have them? I understand you're working with something called nanowires, and diamondoids are involved with nanowires. That's right. So the diamondoids are actually really interesting. They're, they're very rigid, just like you uh, know of diamond as being a rigid object. And so they pack kind of like uh, Legos do. They have very rigid structures, and so they pack in certain ways. And we can use that to help direct where nanowires form. So we actually use a, a synthetic route to form nanowires, which means we make it in solution. And we use the diamondoids to kind of make a little container where that reaction can actually occur. Um, and within this little cage of diamondoids, then you can get different uh, nanowires forming. So the diamond wire... The diamondoids form a little tube first, and then you put the conducting atoms like copper inside the diamondoid? Yeah, it's actually what we would call a cooperative assembly or a self-assembly. And so the diamondoids kind of uh, do this dance together with the copper atoms or the sulfur atoms, and they cooperatively find the best organization for the uh, actual system, for the molecules. And what the diamondoid does is say, no, no, copper, you can't. Uh, go outside of the cage. You have to stay in here. And so they kind of form this gateway uh, that allows the polymerization or the formation of these guys only in one dimension. So it's a one-dimensional wire and in certain locations. Now we actually have some images which illustrate what mm. we're talking about. Can we see that first image, please? Okay, so there it is right there. What are we looking at there? So what you can see here on the upper left is a blow up of one of those diamondoids. So that's what we call adamantane. It's actually the very smallest one that you can possibly have. Uh, it is one cage. It has got 10 carbon atoms in it. So that's really quite small to give you a sense of scale. Uh, the whole width of it is only 3.2 angstroms across. And an angstrom is 10 to uh, the minus 10th uh, meter. So very, very small. On the right-hand side, you can actually see those diamondoids arrayed around this inner core. And that nanowire is actually the smallest nanowire you could make. It's three-atom cross-section. 
And so you can see that it's actually composed of three sulfur atoms, then three copper atoms, three sulfur, three copper, in an alternating array. And that's the inner core. What's really fascinating about that is if you take one, or, uh, one more atom out, it's now a ribbon uh, instead of a solid core. So this is really the smallest nanowire that you can possibly make. So and that can conduct electricity. It can. And the diamondoids are an insulating layer around it that keeps the electricity inside the yeah, wire. Yeah, exactly. Just like your wires in your house, you're going to have an insulator around that keeps the electricity confined. Uh, and that's very important for this kind of structure as well. And you say it assembles by itself. Does that mean that all the atoms in this mixture assemble that way, or some of them will, and you just extract the ones that you want? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what will happen is we'll actually make it in solution uh, in a beaker, if you will. So it's actually a relatively simple apparatus where you're going to have a, uh, a glass beaker, you're going to add different reagents, and they rack together. And what will happen is you'll form these crystals, and these crystals will start growing bigger and bigger. And those are made out of many, many millions of these nanowires forming in parallel. Now we have uh, another image. Let's see the next image, please. Okay, so what are we looking at here? It looks similar to the previous one in some ways. Yeah, so what we do to understand the structure of it is we actually use X-ray crystallography, where we can actually hit the material with a series of X-rays and learn where each atom is placed. And this is a representation of where the atoms are in that structure. And so you can see on the inside is this ring of that copper and sulfur conducting material that we talked about. And on the outside is that shell of diamondoid that kind of directs where these atoms are allowed to react. So you're actually able to see at the atomic level, you can observe this close up and see that all the atoms are in the right places? Yes, it's a technique that will let you see the overall crystal structure. You can't see every single atom, but you can infer where all of them are within the crystal. And that brings up the next image. Can we see the next image, please? Yeah, so this is a really interesting one showing the plane of many wires. So the wires would actually be going vertically, up and down uh, in the solid. And you can see them, again, surrounded by this diamondoid shell. And the interesting thing here is that this is a solid material. It's a crystal. You can hold this in your hand. And yet inside of it are millions of tiny little nanowires that are just three atoms in cross-section. And the wires are parallel to each other, so they don't transmit electricity from one to the other, but they're all carrying electricity separately? That's right. It's just like if you took a bundle of wires that, had uh, that were insulated at home and you put them together, they're not going to short together. And that's a really important property for these nanowires because a lot of their unusual properties are due to their small size and isolation. And what are some of the practical uses of this? Or are you basically a research scientist and other people will figure out what to use it for? Mm -hmm. Well, we're trying to find what we would call more exotic properties like superconductivity and for some of the uh, behavior of electrons at these very small scales can be uh, unusual. For example, the color of uh, quantum dots or color of nanowires can vary depending on their size and their environment. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that we're looking for in these materials. And we are going to get to superconductivity in just a moment with ZX Shen, but first we have one more image from yours, and I'd like to see that last image, just to show the actual size of the nanowires yeah. compared to a penny. And in that rectangular area, those nanowires are magnified by a factor of 10,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's an image of these larger crystals that I was describing as they polymerize. Within each one of those tiny wires that you see there, each one is about 100 nanometers across. Uh, very, very small, so about one one-thousandth of a human hair. And within that, you're going to have uh, millions of these tiny nanowires inside of them. And so you can actually get bulk uh, properties, whereas each one is essentially an individual wire. It's very impressive that you can work with things on such a small scale and see what's going on, which leads us to superconductivity. ZX, you've been involved in this. Uh, first of all, just give a very brief, brief explanation of what superconductivity is and why it's important. Okay, superconductivity is a phenomenon where a conductor loses all its re resistance. So there's no resistance at all. So there's no loss of electricity exactly. through the wire. Yeah, there's one more property. A superconductor repels all the magnetic field. So these are the two fundamental properties that a superconductor as a very special class of material. Well, let me see if I understand. You're saying a superconductor repels? 
Magnetic of, fields? Yes. So if it's, in, if it's in the vicinity of a magnetic field, it'll push it away? That's correct. If, if a superconductor will repel all the uh, magnetic field from its body, that's why you cannot have a magnetic field penetrate a superconductor, except the so-called type 2 superconductor, but that's more complicated and detailed. And how do you work on these superconductors? What do you do in your research to develop? Is it a matter of finding the right material that uh, conducts electricity without loss or in the right configuration? Yeah, okay. Maybe I can try to make a connection as Nick said. We tried in the diamond door looking for exotic properties and we know carbon clusters actually superconducts before. So when Nick and I look at this together, we say, hey, maybe we should explore whether this thing superconducts or not. And that's how we started to work together. Of course, that as research goes, it takes us to a very unexpected places. It took us to a different places, like what Nick alluded to, and also to take us to places about electron emission, display, heat, you know, harvesting, and all different type of technology. Coming back to superconductor, the reason we were interested in superconductor, a superconductor is a sort of exotic property of, elect uh, of uh, conductors. It happens because when you have two electrons forming a Cooper pair, or instead of acting individually, they form a pair, then those pairs are acting in concert with all the other pairs of electrons. That gives the power of a superconductor. So traditionally, you think about how the two electrons both carry negative charge. They will repel each other. Why would they form a pair? In that case, the vibration of atoms comes in. And the carbon clusters often have very strong vibrations. That's why we were interested in this. So the, in other words, you have two vibration of atoms, then put two electrons overcome the natural tension of repulsion and bind them together in a time domain. And that's why they will function as a pair, then the pairs will sort of go in concert with many other pairs. Now, when you have an electric current, uh, that's essentially a flow of electrons, as I understand it. Yes. And so, if you put electrons at this end of the wire, does the same electrode make it all the way to the other end, or does it push this electron, which then pushes the next electron, and so on? And the second part is more closer, yeah. So, it basically, you've generated an electrical field, then so the electrons go in... Uh, in concert because there's a lot of electrons in a piece of conductor. Now we have some images related to your work. Uh, let's take a look. Can we see the first uh, image, please, for ZX? Okay, so there you are. That's a pretty impressive looking machine. What does that machine do? Ah, okay. What we do is try to say we want to understand behavior of the electrons. Mm -hmm. And we have the way we do it is we bombard the materials with light or the photons, knock out the electrons and analyze the energy and momentum parameters of the electrons. However, there are many atoms in air, okay? And of course, those electrons will collide. You can't analyze them very well. That's why you need to do the experiment in very high vacuum, okay? And that very high vacuum is what this machine will generate. It's a vacuum system, and that's how this chamber is. So that chamber would be a high vacuum, and then you'd have a very thin layer of some material and you would bombard it with a certain frequency of light and that would make electron move and somehow you would be able to observe the path of those electrons and that would tell you something about how that material is composed? That's, that's correct. There's a, a, a fact which is named after Einstein. Einstein has this idea that's called a photoelectric effect. You have light coming and knocked out individual electrons and these electrons are free in vacuum and by measuring the speed of electron moving in vacuum and the trajectory, you know its energy. And by knowing where the electron direction is, because you know where your detector is relative to your sample, you know its momentum. These are the very two very important parameters. Knowing them in free space after you've taken them out, then you use conservation laws, you know, energy and momentum conserved, then you can back out how the electron behaves inside the solid. And light actually exerts, exerts a force, right? Light is made of photons, is it? And right. a photon is another type of particle. It's not similar to an electron or a proton. It's a 
yeah, separate you, basic yeah, type of particle? Yeah, you know, light has two, uh, so the duality, it mm -hmm. has a character as a wave, as we all know, the mm -hmm. electromagnetic wave, but all, as Einstein put it in, also has a character as a particle. In this description, you think about light as a particle, it comes in with sufficient amount of energy and momentum to knock out the electron. Okay. Now you have a couple more images. Can we see the oh. next picture, please? Okay, now uh, what, what does this represent? Okay, this image uh, had two things. One is, is an illustration of um, how the superconducting cube, that's the illustration of superconducting cube, being levitated up. From which is, a which is the superconducting part, the disk on the bottom or the cube? No, the cube on top. Okay, the disk on the bottom is an illustration of uh, a magnet. Okay, the trajectories on the cube are the trajectories of electron behavior inside the solid. We measure with the machine you just saw. Mm -hmm. And from that trajectory, how the electron behaves in that trajectory, you learn about how the electrons interact with others. And so that sort of is a conceptual illustration of how a superconductor expel the magnetic field, that's why it got levitated, and inside the superconductor, how the electron will move. Okay. Yeah. So their superconducting cube repels the magnetic field with enough force that it actually lifts the cube. Exactly. Which could have a lot of very useful applications, friction-free, transportation. That's correct. Rail yeah. travel, yeah, yeah. things like yeah. that. Yeah, levitation trains, for example, you know, magnet, maglev trains are one of those things. And uh, in fact, uh, Japan is planning to have a commercial operation of a superconducting train. Now, is the technology there already? Can this be built now? Is uh, the technology sufficiently advanced that it will actually work? The technology uh, uh, working in Japan now has been tested. I think the train has been on testing run for many years. Now they're going for a commercial run. It's 2027 that's supposed to be complete, and uh, it's going to, the design speed will be you know, 500 kilometers per hour. Mm. It's not much slower pretty, than an airplane. Quick. You've yeah. got to be in a pretty big hurry <laughs> yeah. to use that. I think you've got one more image. Can we see that final image, please? All right, now what are we looking at here? Okay, this is an image of a very thin layer of superconductor on a oxide substrate. It turns so the, out... So the blue rectangles are the substrate? Substrate, yeah. Those atoms are um, sort of a very thin, atomically thin layer of superconductor. Mm -hmm. What was interesting was that we want borrow forces from the substrate. And it turns out, in this case, the interaction with the film, the very, very thin film and the substrate, mm -hmm. gave rise to dramatically enhanced superconducting transition temperature or improved properties. So this is actually one of the better examples of engineered superconductors give properties that is not there otherwise by itself. So if you have the right kind of molecules on top of the substrate, and the substrate is also made of the right kind of material, then that will have superconducting properties? Yes, yeah, that's one of the very interesting pathways. We are exploring that, and that of course give you you know, one of our dream is to make higher and higher temperature superconductors because that will give you far-reaching applications in many different fields. So is it a matter of experimenting with many different types of materials in order to find one that produces the properties that you want? I would say it's a guided, uh, educated guess. In other words, you have some understanding, gain some insights. Based on that, you explore and you often gain more insights. That's how scientific enterprise goes. In other words, it's not a random walk. Okay, you have an idea, you test them, you learn from that idea, you go further. In this case, you're thinking, okay, this material and this material combination is this. Maybe I'll test another material, and that doesn't quite work, and you understand why that other material doesn't work. Maybe that property was particularly important. Then you begin to go and explore that. I understand that in order to test these materials, you need special type of machinery, which may not necessarily exist. So sometimes you have to invent your own machines to test the material. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's how scientific enterprises, you have an idea. You, uh, as we know, the tools are very important among mm -hmm. sciences. Okay. And you develop tools to, to test your ideas. 
and it's sort of a stimulated case. Actually, understanding of high temperature superconductivity is one of the very interesting outcomes as a stimulator for advancement of many experimental instrumentations. In so now, what is the ultimate use of superconductivity? Will it just make things, we'll be able to do things we can do now, but more efficiently? Or will we be able to do things that we can't do now at all? Either one of you could answer. Okay, yeah, maybe we can ask ourselves in the following way. Um, one of the dream of our field is try to see making higher and higher temperature superconductors. Okay, our, of course, ultimate dream will be a room temperature superconductor. Even before we get there, you, we begin to see many interesting applications of superconductivity. The levitation train and magnetic imaging, you know, if you go MRI, take an MRI in a hospital, that you see superconductivity at work. Mm -hmm. um, you would say the following, you know, we sometimes define the period of human civilization by materials. We have stone, uh, we have stone age and we have bronze and we have iron. Maybe the f future historians will say this is the age of silicon. And if you ask what will be the material has a potential for a next one which can have an impact on a period of human civilization. I don't know whether we can find a particle room temperature superconductor. Had we find that thing, then and op optimizing, then it has the potential to be a, one of the comparing candidates because you have an impact on medicine. We talk about transportation, certainly, certainly energy transport and communication, so pretty wide range. So superconductivity, one of the most important scientific developments that will have a bigger impact than most of the other things? I would say is one of those things is that it's a strategically important and it's a deeply intellectual problem as now. I think it's a far, uh, it's because we're far away from you know, widespread applications, but it's one of those places with a lot of potential and it's a fascinating phenomenon by itself. I'm interested in how the whole scientific process works with the research. Do you try new things and most of the experiments fail, but once in a while something succeeds and then you build on that? Like you've both got a lot of graduate students and postdocs you know, working for you. Um, so how does that work? Can you give any insight into how you like conceive an idea and how something goes from being an idea to being an experiment to being a real world result? Yeah, I think ZX said it very nicely earlier, which is it's kind of a, a knowledge-driven guess that we know some things about the system, and then we're trying to design a new system or new experiment around it to increase our knowledge. So for the diamondoids, for example, as ZX was saying, if you have one thin layer of material, we know it's an exotic superconductor. It superconducts really well. But if you have two layers, not anymore. And so that says that, wow, going thin is really important. So how else could you go thin? And this is, uh, you know, making these super thin nanowires is an exact outcome of that thought process where you say, how do we go even thinner than one layer, one sheet of material, and that is one column of material. And so that's why we, we decided to go after this new method to make really, really small wires. So it's not just nanowires, but superconducting nanowires? That's the hope, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would say that sometimes, in addition to what Nick just said, uh, uh, also research sometimes take you to unexpected. That's really the you know, fascinating part and most fun part of it. Nature surprises you. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, we talk about superconductors, the discovery of room temp uh, the high temperature superconductivity in copper based material by itself was a surprising thing because we don't expect that. And we didn't expect that it was uh, something beyond what we saw was possible. So it, it, it liberates your mind. Mm -hmm. In diamond oil research, coming back to it, it's also sometimes it takes you to a different places and inspire new ideas. For example, we, as I said, we try to make super diamond oil superconduct, but it turns out that diamond toys doesn't like electrons, it spit out electrons. So it certainly is not very good for superconductor mm -hmm. if you spit out electrons. However, it inspires many ideas because if you boil, you can efficiently boil off electrons, spit out electrons like you're boiling off water here. 
then what happens is that you can use this for, say, light emission display. You can also generate the energy with it because you can use that to harvest heat, wasting heat, wasted heat or many interesting applications. So maybe you'll come up with an unexpected discovery which will create a new lead and maybe some of your graduate students or postdocs will go off and start their own group uh, starting with this lead and pursue this whole new direction while you remain working on your current direction. Indeed, as that happened, actually, the two students, Nick and I, jointly supervised, actually, they, they taking that route, which is not what we anticipated, and they start a company now. So, indeed, that's one of, one of the unexpected outcomes. Is this work that takes a lot of patience, like, you know, most days there's no visible progress, and every once in a while it's like, wow, this is great, or is it like every day you discover new things? Well, it's always building up to that big experiment. So the day-to-day -day work is like any job in many cases, that you're building things to get to that point where you can make the experiment, where that's when you get that uh, amazing discovery. And sometimes discoveries, as ZX mentioned, are not as obvious as, wow, we discovered something new. It's like, wow, that's not what we expected. Hmm. And then you find out later that you can really understand that something totally different was going on than what you were anticipating. We just have about 30 seconds left. If a very young person was thinking of a career in scientific research, what would you tell them? Oh, absolutely. It's a fascinating field, and it, uh, you know, the future of our engineering country depends on it. It's really amazing to be the first one to realize a novel phenomenon in nature. It's an amazing feeling when you realize you're the first one to realize that amazing thing about nature. Okay, great. I think that's a very good place to wrap up the show. I'd like to thank my two guests, uh, Nick Malosh and uh, ZX Shen. Uh, thank you for watching. Visit our website at www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, I'm Marty Wasserman, and we'll see you next time.